Everything is special. In the 1930s, farm goods are special. And we have to quote unquote stabilize the market. And then we have labor relationships. Well, these are special. Then, of course, you can't allow people in New York City to figure out how to rent an apartment because real estate is special. Anytime you call something special, it's the mark of Zorro. It's the mark of Cain on your forehead. Hi, I'm Nick Gillespie with Reason TV, and today we are sitting down with Richard Epstein. He is the Lawrence A. Tisch Professor at New York University Law. He also has an appointment at the University of Chicago and at the Hoover Institution. Richard, thanks for talking to us. Oh, it's always a pleasure. Let's get to it. Uh, you were among the people who predicted the, uh, that Obamacare would fail not simply because it was bad, a bad idea, but the implementation would be virtually impossible to do. In the Obamacare exchanges now, we are seeing so, you know, basically a, some sort of death spiral or some kind of predictable outcome. Talk a little bit about that and you know, what is happening and why didn't more people see it coming? Well, I, I think we start with the second question first, why more people didn't see it coming? And I think the explanation really is that these were all the kind of Ivy League super jocks. And what they always believed is that they could defeat the law of gravity by the ingenious schemes that they would put into place in order to keep things under control. So when this thing was actively debated in 2008 and 2009, uh, there were two approaches to the problem. People like myself said, look, you know, healthcare insurance is not, set, not really special, but you have to understand about all insurance scheme is that the greatest chance of conniving is typically with the insured and not with the insurer. And I said, the way in which we kind of know this is you go back to the history of marine insurance and you start to see that the insurance companies were always given the options to pull out uh, because they understood that the concealment of information by the insurers would have very adverse effects on what they did. And it was also clear that the people who would come for insurance were those who had private information, which made it, made it more likely than average that they would be the ones who would need the stuff. But don't we solve this? This is, oh, well, we, no, well, I'll stop you right there, Richard. You know, you're at NYU in Chicago, not at an Ivy League school. We fix that because you have to buy insurance. Well, we didn't fix it because of that. Um, first of all, what we do is we say you have to buy it, but the mandates are extremely unpopular, and the idea that you're going to run a social program with great popular acceptance acceptance, which says you have to pay if you don't want to take something that you don't want to buy, uh, really sticks in the craw of just about everybody, because this is sort of the kind of libertarian moment that is respected by all people, because it's not dealing with what large business and industry does, it's dealing with what you have to do in your particular life. Uh, so what you have to do is to tell people, we want you to go into these plans and you're going to be damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. Well, you're damned if you do because it turns out many of the people who are going to be forced in are those who will be forced to pay premiums higher than the actual value of the policy because the implicit assumption in all systems of social insurance is that you have cross subsidies against different groups. So there are one guys who are going to be running for the exit and then there's another group which is going to be diving to get into the program because they'll be paying average rates of insurance for superior levels of coverage. So that's, I mean, basically this is, you know, if you're under 30, you're paying a lot more than you would in the, in the free market or what passes for the free market in insurance to get less stuff, but then if you're over 50 or over 45, you're actually getting a real break. And so it means that more people, the more people, older people go in, they tend to be sicker, they tend yeah. to use Well, it's use even money worse more. than that. I mean, the basic ratio is, you know, the typical person in their 20s is going to pay about 20% of the premiums of the sick person in the 60s. Uh, but remember, there's going to be a dispersion amongst the people inside the 20s. And there'll be some of these people, unfortunately, who will be quite sick. They will know that they're quite sick. And so they will join into the system. At the same level, there are people in their 60s who are very healthy, and they will decide to stay out of the system. Uh, so even though you're talking about the basic situation, what you're doing is you're underestimating the level of the skew, because private information will mean that both groups will be self-selecting in a very powerful way. But, and, and the whiz kids who put this together, they, they did not even consider that, or they missed the math. They didn't understand the multiples of the of the kind of scam. I, I going think on. what they did is they understood the math, but I think they thought that they would be able to persuade people morally or otherwise to do this. They also missed another feature, which has been explained to me, and which I had missed for a long period of time. We treat this as though it's a matter of individual people enrolling in these particular plans. But people who are sick are always a me me member of various kinds of health groups. So if you have a kid with ju juvenile di diabetes, you join all the associations online to learn about it. 
these associations then direct you to the way in which you can enroll. Uh, so that instead of it being a relatively slow resorting of the marketplace, these interest groups tend to drive things much more rapidly. On the other side, when you start to deal with people who want to get out of the plan, uh, they now realize that, oddly enough, there is a market alternative which was not that commonly available under Obamacare. And that's the walk-in medical care, city MD, and so mm -hmm. forth. Uh, so if you turn out not to be a part of these programs, uh, you can get pretty good primary care without having to endure the ordeal of an emergency room by getting yourself involved with one of these things. Uh, so it turns out that there is rapid entry on one side, which was underestimated, and rapid exit on the other side that was underestimated. And what strangely happened is given that the rules of the game were established by Obamacare, then market forces come in mm -hmm. and they accelerate the movement in both directions. And so by the time this thing turns out to be done, uh, what happens is all the individual plans, which are not buffered, essentially are going to go belly up. And you know, I said this, I can't tell you how many times in 2000 and 2009. And what you were always met with was this sort of you know, superior Ivy League sneer by individuals who knew so much better than you as to how to run this Rube Goldberg compaction that they thought they could defeat the law of gravity. Uh, let's just put it out there. You do have an Ivy League degree or two yeah. in your background, okay? Oh, so you, so many Ivy League Okay, so painful. this is like, this is the equivalent of you making fun of your own mother. You can do it. Oh, well, I, I will happily do that. I mean, look, I was always in the Ivy League in terms of my education, but I was always out of the Ivy League league in terms of my general intellectual dispositions. And the reason I feel so strongly about this issue in so many cases is I was always at places with people cleverer than myself putting up schemes that were dumber than anything that you could ever imagine. That was the kind of intellectual environment you went to uh, a little bit at Columbia College and even more at the Yale Law School. At Oxford, which is another very elite institution, uh, what was striking about the English experience is that the pro-labor sentiment on the part of just about everybody in town was just inordinate. And I get there in 1964 stay till 1966, and I watched the slow motion decline of the English system, which essentially imploded when Martha, Margaret Thatcher took over in 1980. So I've been around failure for a long time, and what happens is people just don't seem to change their mind in response to adverse information. Well, just, uh, just to uh, uh, kind of stick on that point for a second, uh, do you think in today's world, uh, you know, clearly something like Obamacare, centralizes power in many ways in the, in the healthcare industry. You point to a couple ways in which it's actually also created markets that didn't exist before. But is this a bigger or worse problem than it's ever been of a kind of elite dictating more and more parts of our lives? Not because they're not trying to, but do we have more, you know, is power centralizing or decentralizing in any kind of understandable way in American society? Well, I think it's clearly centralizing. In part, it's in the Congress, but more conspicuously in the last eight years, it's tends to centralize in the president. Um, because what happens is George Bush sort of made announcements and murmurs that he would engage in executive vetoes of one kind or another or initiatives, but he was never prepared to play the nuclear option. Uh, Obama comes into the office, and while he'd been a critic of presidential power was in the Senate, uh, when he faces a Congress which is essentially trying to frustrate most of what he does, he doesn't take any objection by Republicans as being legitimate. He simply says that they're obstructionists, so I'm going to do it to the extent that I can by myself. So unilateralism becomes a dominant mode. And now when you have unilateralism... But is the president more effective? Uh, you know, or single th you know the, the pres President Obama has been trying to do all sorts of things yeah. that he can't get done, or, or that people are just like, forget about it. Is he controlling immigration policy? Is He might try to control immigration mm -hmm. policy. He gets rebuffed by the courts, but more to the point, he's rebuffed by immigrants because they're not coming because the economy sucks. Well, so, I mean, that's what I'm getting at in a large sense. Well, is yes. power fully only going in a centralized way or is, you know, are there all of these kind of loopholes that people Well, what happens out? is, look, when you centralize power in a president, it's what they said about the little girl. When she was good, she was very, very good, and when she was bad, she was horrid. Um, what happens is you don't have the buffer of multiple institutions, so you could tend to lurch one way or another. If you have strong movements of government power, what you will do is have decentralized responses to it by people who are trying to minimize the result. 
Uh, so what you do is you get politics at both levels. You get people being very politically directive at the center and then people being politically responsive on the outside in an effort to sort of minimize the flow. So for example, on Obamacare, uh, what happens is we are now entering into a compliance culture in which if you do something wrong, the sanctions are always draconian. And so you A, have to have somebody to fix it so you don't get punished, and B, you have to make sure that all your ducks in order so that if something goes wrong, you can have all sorts of defenses against these kinds of things. Well, the compliance culture essentially requires industry concentration to be acceptable. If you double the size of a firm, you don't double the size of your compliance cost. And so one of the things that Obamacare has done is it has led to a wave of hospital and industry mergers in an effort to minimize compliance costs, thereby creating higher levels of market concentration, which leads to monopoly power. And the reason why that's bad is because then they can be or tend to, they become overly bureaucratized, but also they, they don't have to respond to customer d demands. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this was one of the, the, one of the central choice that you face in a political situation when you see an imperfection is as follows. Either you try to, try to remove it or you try to create a compensating imperfection. And my view is you always do the former, you never do the latter. Uh, so if there are restraints on entry which make the markets relatively monopolistic at the state level, what you do is you allow insurance companies that operate outside the state to sell business inside the state in order to create essentially more levels of competition. Um, what Obama did was essentially cut a deal with the insurance companies. He said, you join in my monopolistic program, I'm going to make sure that the barriers against entry are in place. And so what you do is you get a dumb monopoly instead of a reasonably intelligent competitive system. This gets done over and over again. Uh, there's always the tendency to say, ah, this doesn't work, so now we have to put that in place. Well, it turns out that the cure that you have to the disease is not specific to the disease. And what you do is you now create distortions in third markets, then you play the game over and over again. So there's always this constant ready supply of justification for meddlesome interventions, and it's going to ruin all markets, whatever I've, they run. I've heard uh, some people who are you know, kind of trying to find a pony under the, the pile of Obamacare say, you know, one possible good thing is that by pushing more and more providers or more and more companies and, and uh, you know, uh, employers to having high deductible, uh, you know, low premium, high deductible plans that for that first 3000 or first $5,000 that you're paying out of pocket for various things, that that will actually create market incentives. And I know this going back because I've been on a, a high deductible plan for years before Obamacare. At various points, I would go into my, uh, the doctor, and for the first time, I would, he would say, oh, here's a drug for something, and I would ask him how much that cost. And he would actually ask you know, somebody in the office to find out what it was and then say, oh, you know what, that's kind of expensive. Here's a cheaper alternative, market forces at work. Yeah. Do you think Obamacare's push towards that kind of uh, yeah. lower, <laughs> high deductible thing, will that help create a market, and will that help medical care or will it just kind of be closed in in, a, in an otherwise no, awful system? this is the system. city MD phenomenon. Mm -hmm. It turns out that if the plans are so clunky and so expensive and if you can't actually give things, people the things that they want, you have to give them things that they don't want, uh, you're going to basically do this by having a deductible. Now they're spending their own money for a large portion of the situation and they will tend to it. Um, you know, there have been many studies, for example, looking at the cost of cosmetic surgery as opposed to the cost of covered surgery. And cosmetic is elective, but people care a great deal about it, but they shop for this because they know it's paying from out of their own pockets. And you know, this very simple view that people actually take into account cost and benefits when they bear both will tend to ignore costs when they're borne by somebody else is thought to be one of these shibboleths that only a Chicago-based market economist right. can believe. But because in fact- med Medical care, health care, like a couple of other things, yeah, operates it, totally differently yeah, than any other is, market. Everything yeah. is special. Yeah. I mean, years ago, I wrote a series of papers on why health care is special claiming that it isn't special. And the moment you start to make it special, it just turns out to overheat in particular ways. But the special metaphor is used everywhere. So to give you an example, in the 1930s, we start introducing the Agricultural Adjustment Acts, which completely wrecked farm prices. Why do we do it? Because farm goods are special. Um, why are they special? Because they're highly responsive to changes in supply and demand, which is a good thing. And we have to quote unquote, stabilize the market. It's a disaster. And then we have labor relationships. Well, these are special, and why are they special? 
special because these employers have complete dominant power, even in competitive markets. So even in the face of rising wages when productivity increases, we unionize this stuff and we create the imbalances because labor markets turn out to be special. Then, of course, rental is clearly special. You can't allow people in New York City to figure out how to rent an apartment. You have to put a rent stabilization program in there because real estate is special. Anytime you call something special, it's the mark of Zorro, it's the mark of Cain on your forehead. You are about to kill a particular market in the name of trying to make it accessible and affordable to everybody let's, else. Uh, you know, we're trying to reach a wider and wider audience with Reason TV. Uh, so let's, uh, have you had work done? Let's go back to cosmetic surgery. You look fabulous. Have you had work done? Absolutely not. But if you did, you would shop for the best price. I, I would have my wife shop for the best okay. price. I mean, I, I understand where these forces of agency work work their best and they don't work with me. I'm a terrible consumer, <laughs> as it turns out, so I delegate the responsibility uh, to somebody who is a terrific consumer. Uh, so, well, let's talk about another special case of, of, of kind of law enforcement or government investigation, and this has to do with state's attorneys generals going after ExxonMobil, and we assume many, many other companies and many, many other fields, but uh, claiming essentially analogizing between tobacco companies and the research that they generated knowing about the uh, carcinogenic effects yeah. of their products to ExxonMobil knowing about global warming. Tell us, walk us through, what is the case that the attorneys general are trying to make and what do you think? Uh, well, about? first of all, I think you actually have to understand the tobacco cases better than is commonly known. And, and I say this as somebody who actually, as a rabid anti-smoker, organized much of the defenses. You're that to the left of Hitler on the anti-smoking oh, question. Oh, I mean, I just hate smoking. Okay. Uh, but I actually represented Philip Morris for many years and I tried to figure out how it is you put together the defenses in the tobacco cases. Because if you believe in the notion of individual responsibility and you start to think that the risk of tobacco are covert and latent, uh, you're living in a myth man. I could recall in 1952 with my radiology father, uh, we were all the kids riding him about being a smoker saying, Dad, why do you want to kill yourself when you know that this stuff is very, very dangerous? And we actually got him to quit. And so, you know, my... How could that be? Though? What? Because nobody knew until the Surgeon General put... Uh, no, that's completely no, obvious. I mean, yeah. if you just look, the cigarettes were called coffin nails in the 1930s. Reader's Digest put this huge expose out in 1952. But, but it is true also that the tobacco companies kept a constant line of information going out about yeah. mitigating or military, or just saying, no, it's not. It actually I mean, just I agree in. that yep. they should not have done that. My view right. about it is it was completely ineffective in part mm -hmm. because the information that you got from independent sources was much more mm -hmm. valuable. Let me give you okay. sort of one of the ironies about all of this. They, one of the things is there was a program, I think it was by Chesterfield, which says uh, medical doctors, and they show you a guy with a thing over his eyes, um, tell you that Chesterfields are easy on your T-zone, smoke Chesterfields, right? What do you think the effect of that particular commercial was? Well, it had two effects. One is if you didn't smoke Chesterfields, what these guys are telling you is that Chesterf these other cigarettes are really deadly. So for the first mm -hmm. time, the dangers of cigarettes were brought home by the cigarette companies. And then people looked at Chesterfield and said, why are these guys different from anybody else? Yeah. So the effect of these ads to give you medical assurances essentially reduced the level of smoking more dramatically in the 70s than the warnings of 1964. Should they have paid out anything to smokers? No. I mean, we organized the defenses and they never did pay out anything to smokers. Mm -hmm. They paid out many things to Medicaid and it's a big difference. What happened with the cigarette cases is when we came up there, this we had a two-part defense. And the first part of the defense was to explicate what it means to talk about uh, tobacco increasing the risk of various serious health helps. Uh, the stupid position would be to deny this. The correct position is to say that when you're talking about this, it is not the same kind of causation you get when you're hit by a falling brick. Uh, the probability of getting cancer increases with smoking, but it's a curve and you have to figure out what it is. It turns out that the really negative act adverse effects tend to be delayed in time, and the frequency is not quite as high as many people go. Uh, so you're certainly talking about a risk which to me was large enough that I never wanted to get near this stuff. But if people really find that cigarettes give them some other collateral advantage, you could explain in equilibrium why it is that they're going to smoke. As the information gets better, 
uh, that cigarettes are more dangerous, what happens is you start to see a systematic decline in the rate of smoking and in the toxicity of the cigarettes that are being smoked. And one of the real negative... When does that take place? Uh, it starts in the, late the mid to late 1950s. Okay. By this particular time, you start seeing the rise of the filter tip cigarettes and so forth. You start seeing low tar, low nicotine. Right. If you look at the brand switches, the Paul Moores and the old Golds, which were the really deadly ones, uh, start to go out. Uh, so it turns out that the rate of smoking goes down and the toxicity of the particular cigarette starts to go down, which is perfectly consistent with a rational market of information being absorbed. And you know, the cigarette companies may have done some terrible things at the time, and I've seen some of this stuff, and I really don't want to defend any of that. But when it came to the smoking stuff, we gave this account of causation, and then we went on the assumption of risk side. The most famous case was Rose Chipalone, and by God, everybody in her family from the beginning of time to the end said, Rose, this stuff is going to kill you, it's going to hurt mm -hmm. your baby, why do you smoke? It was her doctor, it was her minister, it was her family, it was her friends. She knew all of this stuff, and you could never win these cases before a jury. Uh, precisely because the enormity of the knowledge was an everyday affair to these people and the fact that somebody's putting out a commercial here, there, or the other thing really isn't dominating the information mm -hmm. flow. And this was, I think, correct. Well, the way the cigarette companies got beaten is the Medicaid arguments made by the provider saying we actually had to pay these particular people to take care of you and we have an independent cause of action. This is bogus as a matter of general law, but the moment you allow for the independent cause of action, it turns out all the assumption of risk defenses disappear and so it now becomes a collection case and you can make a fortune, which they promptly do and then they securitize this stuff. And the great irony is once the tobacco companies make the settlement with the states on this various issue, what they do is they now have a protector because mm -hmm. the states don't want that cash flow to disappear. They make it impossible for new cigarette companies with cheap tar, uh, low tar and nicotine to enter into the market because you now have a government-sponsored cartel. The state owns a fraction of the tobacco companies. And every uh, year or every couple of years, you hear states starting to complain about how they're getting, bringing in less and less money from tobacco settlements. So what are they going to do next? Well, I, I, they're not going to get it from yeah. ExxonMobil, if that's what the question is. I, I think it's just a dying stream of revenue. So, well, talk about, uh, okay, and so, I mean, just so we're clear, you don't think tobacco companies shouldn't, shouldn't have paid anything to anybody beyond you know, the taxes that they paid. Whatever, yeah, so, I mean, yeah. look, I, I was, a, and this was the position in the restatement second of torts in 1965. This was the common position. Uh, the way in which it was stated is good tobacco, that was the words in the restatement, um, basically is something that we expect because there's no deviation between what you get and what you want. But if it's contaminated with something like marijuana, that's right. what was said yeah, by yeah, Mr. Really, Brasso. Yeah, yeah. Um, you did. And when I worked for Philip Morris, I mean, one of the questions I asked him is what would you do if you found out that you had a defective bunch of tobacco with contaminants right. that could hurt. And this is what they said. If we thought there were a thousand cigarettes like this, we would remove a million from the marketplace. Because we knew that if a single product deviated from the expectations that we had, we were cooked. We are slaves mm -hmm. to our reputation and we move aggressively. This is true of every consumer product And the idea the that they fed a stream of disinformation or misinformation to consumers or to regulators or anything that's, that's really not appropriate or relevant here because well, nobody believed that, well, it. Well, A, I think nobody believed it. B, again, I have, you'd have to go back and read these things because what happens is uh, they did say things that you would disagree with, but whether it was open and shut mm -hmm. in the way in which okay. it was put, remember all the guys who are putting the spin and interpretation of this on the plaintiff's lawyers. And, you know, mm -hmm. my view is if I went back and I read these evidences one after another, I would find some of them less credible, some of them more credible. Um, there's always some degree of doubt. I mean, one of the things that I think is widely misunderstood is the rate at which uh, the increased risk takes place. Uh, the best work in this stuff was actually done by a guy hired by a tobacco company, a guy named Kip Viscusi, yeah. and, and his rates of information on this were much lower than those which were put on the other side. And merely to have you know Ronald Reagan famously or Jackie mm -hmm. Robinson or yeah. opera singer saying you know this it cools my throat or it gives me yeah. pep. That's not fraud, uh, you know, that's not actionable. That's what we call, pull, that's what we yep. call puff, but those ads were actually blocked by 1960. Right. Um, there used to be standard baseball endorsements, Stan Musial smokes X, Y, and Z cigarette. I mean, I'm not, look, I don't want to say that this is not crazy, and let's suppose yeah. we did find out that there was some degree of systematic fraud by the companies. Uh, the correct response is a fine. 
mm -hmm. uh, by the government, which tries to measure, roughly speaking, what the social cost is. Uh, but given the fact that there's so many sources of information, the thought that this information is decisive and needed any more than a tiny fraction of the smoking cases strikes me as being wildly overstated. And it's interesting because, you know, when people like Vaco come out and say, well, I'm against Exxon Mobil prosecution, but I did the cigarette sentiment, you read what he said about them, and, and it turns out he doesn't quite get the case. Yeah. The tobacco companies won the following litigation every time. Uh, a health provider that was not Medicaid came forward and said, our costs have been increased because your representations to smokers have led them to increase smoking, and so therefore you owe us the increased cost of care for these people. Every single court mm -hmm. that faced those issues said, no, these particular damages are much too remote. It was only the peculiar and special status of Medicare, which meant that the public side could get money. So even talk about Medicare and Medicaid. What is it about those programs? It's yeah. only Medicaid. Medicaid, rather. Mm -hmm. um, uh, government-funded uh, health, health insurance, why did that, well, why was they, that a decisive difference? What, they, what happened is they, these people said, we have a government obligation in order to take care of these people. And since you increased the particular work that we had to do, you have to pay for the increased cost. The traditional rule about this has always been the exact opposite. Suppose there was a smoker who got Medicaid uh, coverage, uh, what would happen is he would then be asked to assign the health portion of his tort claim against the tobacco companies to the government to pursue. The basic rule on this assignment or the subrogation claim is always that you take subject to the defenses that could be raised against the smoker. So if you treat this as a derivative action from the smoker, all the assumption of risk stuff, both public and private, comes in, and we win as the tobacco companies. But if you treat it as an independent cause of action with a statutory base, which the private guys don't have, then it turns out you lose. Um, and then what you do is you get very favorable judgments on causation uh, because it's assumed that everything that happened would have been different if the information flow had been different from the government. But that, of course, is overstated given the huge amounts of private information that people chose to disregard because they wanted to smoke. Um, so I don't think that these cases are easy. Um, I, as I said, I'm a strong anti-smoker, but one of the advantages... Now, as a matter of fact, I think you likened yourself to Hitler. Well, I didn't came to the, well, I, you I, said you were worse than Hitler. Well, well whatever it is, I, I've never had a cigarette yeah. in my life, and I take a, a lot of credit in persuading many people who should have known better to quit uh, Look, starting when I was a boy. How old are you now? 73. Okay. You know, do you want to try? We can, we can run out and get some cigarettes. No, I have no desire whatsoever That would be a, an be exciting a, moment. It would be essentially, I would regard it as an immortal okay. death threat. Yes. I, I just don't want to have a puff of that stuff in me. Right. Uh, but, you know, I think most people understood that they have different traits off from yep. me. And look, one of the things about having a no liability regime, which is actually important, is now when people decide to smoke, they realize they're going to have to bear the consequences of this. And so it's a nice sort of gentle reminder to you that costly activities, the cost is going to be borne on you. If you give the warranty, then you externalize the cost on somebody Well, else. so let's talk about this new uh, case, which is kind of fascinating, about the idea that, uh, you know, attorneys generals who you know, Lord love them, they're pretty inventive, but now they want to go after ExxonMobil for the effects of global warming. Talk a little bit about that. Well, I mean, first of all, I think they did want to do this. There was this great uh, press conference in the end of March of this year in which um, Eric Schneiderman trotted out the hapless Al Gore, and they sort of announced that, well, the First Amendment doesn't protect fraud, and all of these companies have engaged in systematic fraud on global warming, and we're going to go after them. And he said, I have the Martin Act to do this. Um, I'm actually doing a fairly detailed study on the Martin Act now for the Manhattan Institute, and it certainly gives you a leg up in these particular cases, but no decisive advantage. Explain the Mar Martin well, Act. The Martin Act, well, first of all, to explain what the Martin Act is, you have to understand what the basic common law rules of fraud are. And we commonly talk about a kind of a five-finger fraud. And in order for it to be fraud, there has to be scienter, that is, knowledge that the statement that you make is false, or reckless disregard as to whether it's true or false. Uh, then it actually has to be a statement of fact. It can't be a prediction. It can't be an opinion. Uh, then it turns out that somebody has to rely on it. That's the causal connection. He has to rely on it to his detriment. 
and then it turns out that he has to have injury. And in addition to this, generally speaking, it's required that the statements on which people rely are material, that is, sufficiently important so that they would move the rational investor. And when you refer to the puff, you know, this is the best cigarette in town, materiality is the opposite of the puffery, and puff has never been regarded as fraud. So if you say this is the finest restaurant on the south side of Chicago, and 18 people are saying it, you can't sue 17 of them for fraud. Um, so that's the basic situation. What the Martin Act tended to do was to relax some of the requirements. Uh, it said you don't have to prove Sienta, but in most of these cases it was perfectly evident that it happened. Uh, then it would say that you don't have to prove individual reliance because you're making these announcements to the world and we don't pe want people buying worthless stock and we're going to enjoin it before there actually is reliance taking place. And then we said we don't have to prove damages and if you're dealing with injunctions that's also perfectly sensible because why do you want to have to have people get injured when you could stop the injury beforehand? And when applied to sort of garden variety commercial frauds, as was originally done from starting in the 20s and so forth, the Martin Act was useful. Elliot Spitzer comes along and he decides to rev it up going against public corporations. And it's a little bit more complicated. Hank Greenberg is the main target of this. And it's a very contentious sort of litigation. But now he's trying to do it in the area of global warming. And, and you see, wait a second, this is crazy. First of all, let's just start with a single thing. What does Mr. Eric Schneiderman know about global warming? I think the answer is nothing whatsoever. And so what I've done is I've always been a skeptic on the global warming side, uh, but it's important to explain what skepticism means. There's a kind of a basic fundamental formula out there, widely accepted by everyone on both sides, uh, that what you do is you measure the change in temperature as a function of the increase, say, the doubling of carbon dioxide. And what it is, the function is logarithmic which means that if you double something, it turns out that the actual change in temperature won't double. It will be less than that. Um, and the question then is just how much. There is something called a sensitivity coefficient. And if that number is very big, then the effect is going to be very large. If that coefficient is small, it's going to be very small. Well, the proposition which says that everybody understands that increases in carbon dioxide results in increases in temperature is true for anybody who believes that this sensitivity coefficient is greater than zero. Everybody on every side of the debate believes that. The issue is not whether or not there's an increase. The issue is how big is the coefficient, which will tell us how rapid the increase is going to turn out to be. On that question, there is an enormous amount of dispute. The IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Control, the UN type of operation, tends to put the coefficient at three. Uh, the people who are more skeptical say it's probably closer to one and much lower. If you then start to look at these things, the data is a better fit to the lower coefficient more recently than it is to the higher coefficient. And even this turns out to be somewhat mysterious. If you take the last 16 years, the increase in carbon dioxide concentrations in the atmosphere has been about 13%. Uh, the increase in temperature over this same particular period is pretty close to zero. Uh, the other great measure that you're looking at is the number of sort of storm-like events, typhoons, hurricanes, and so forth. Um, if you look at a graph, there's a high variability across years, but there's no question that if you took a single trend line, it's actually down rather than up over the last 120 years. Uh, so if you're trying to put these two things together, uh, what happens is it is sure that there's some increase, but it's much lower. Then so, the question is just one more point, is, and what's the consequence of the increase? Well, increases in carbon dioxide without major increases in temperature are wonderful because they improve plant life. So the issue is much more complicated. And if ExxonMobil changes its points of view, maybe they actually know something that Mr. Schneiderman doesn't. Hmm. So what are, the, uh, what are the AGs trying to do, though? What are, I mean, is this, and is this just a, a, an assertion of will over a, an industry that's very easy to vilify? Um, is, I mean, is it that blank of uh, abuse of power, or is it, you know, what are they hoping to get out of this? Well, actually, it's very interesting because uh, this particular campaign is in complete disarray. Um, Schneiderman thought he had put together an alliance in March of this year. Uh, but as he started to go deeper and deeper into this thing, all the various other attorney generals started to back off. There was this fellow called Walker in, 
in the Virgin Islands who wanted to put subpoenas to the Competitive right. Enterprise Institute and AEON to figure out whether or not the people who had received money from Exxon Mobil had been crooks. And you know, there was a huge blowback on this because now it looks like it's the Spanish Inquisition being run by some ignoramus um, who doesn't have a large stake in anything at all. And so he's backed off a little bit. Um, it turns out that Schneiderman has now backed off the effort to try and figure out what they did in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. If you look at the studies on which he relied, the sort of revelation by these various climate groups, the only reason why the revelations look to be plausible is they have complete certitude that they understand what the impact is of the climate change. And if you look at other people, they don't. So recently I spoke with a group of physicists, all retired because I think they're worried about political blowback, and they've put together something called the carbon dioxide coalition. So I've actually read their literature. And you know, this is the most boring literature imaginable because it's a bunch of graphs and tables and charts and so forth. And you come away from that stuff saying, look, I'm not sure that they're right. I mean, good scientific procedures has let them be attacked by somebody on the other side and then respond. Uh, but the thought that they can be ignored given the data that they assembled and the sophistication that they put it together in would be something of a travesty. And, and so this entire climate debate has been characterized by a shrillness and dogmatism based on one sense that 97% of the scientists in the world believe in climate change. Well, I would count myself as one of that 97% if I were a scientist, but I'm not going to be somebody who's going to be, you know, sort of absolutely alarmed about all of this stuff. And what's happened is when people start using the word deniers, they're trying to bring back memories of the Holocaust. And they're saying, look, we will lose millions of people to global warming, and it's just like what Hitler did um, when he slaughtered innocent people those days. Well, this is not that particular situation future, it's a prediction. Um, if you're trying to figure out what the remedies are, one of the things that's so disgraceful about the Obama administration is they don't even know how to put together an intelligent program to deal with pollution. And there's so many things that they can do which would limit this problem and a thousand others, uh, but they insist upon using rather antiquated environmental statutes instead of retooling the entire project from beginning. Let's, uh, let's talk about Obama and his legacy. He is still president, or at least that's what I read in the newspapers. Yes. And uh, how would you uh, sum up his, the effect that he has had, you know, after two terms, president, uh, taking office during a difficult economic uh, moment, mm -hmm. and also, you know, passing what we constantly are told, a transformative health care bill. Um, how do you sum up his legacy? What are the things that we should be mindful of both of what he did right and wrong and what we should be looking to avoid or replicate in future uh, administrations. Well, I think the right list is pretty short. I can't think of any major initiative that he made that I agree with. Um, there are things on which he's less bad, there's things that he's kind of neutral, and then there's a largest list of things that are terrible. I mean, the first thing I think that one has to say about him is he just absolutely projects the wrong moral tone as somebody who sits in high office. He is dogmatic beyond all possible belief, and yet his information base turns out to be extraordinarily weak. One of the things that I always ask when I think about a professor or a president is what was their undergraduate education like? And it's quite clear he didn't have any. Um, um, at that particular level. So he works with a very thin information base and he makes these very striking assertions. What, what's an example of that? Well, you start with the global warming stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, the guy looks out at a beautiful ocean and he says, I see just terrifying consequences in the future. But he has no idea of whether this stuff is right or wrong. And if you actually ask him to sit down and go into the science, I'm not even sure he knows what a logarithm is, which would be essential to figuring out the way this thing works. On the healthcare stuff, he's just dismissive of every private organization. So when they had this disastrous rollout, which everybody knew was coming in 2012, this man gets up and sort of announces to the world, well, I'm getting rid of all these crummy and private insurance plans, and I'm giving you a better plan. He has no idea what the content of those private plans was or what the public plans are. And it turns out the public plans are just terrible because they require you to buy the insurance on things that you don't want, uh, whereas the private plans tend to concentrate on the things that people start to want. So you throw six million people off of there, and at the same time, you won office in part because of this insidious campaign against Mitt Romney back in the summer of 2012, in which you said when Bain Capital took over this business, one guy lost his health care insurance and died of cancer six years later. The individual instance was a complete fabrication, and the larger implication that somebody else who works in private business doesn't care about individual people is crazy. When eight or nine million people lose their insurance, in the fall of 2012, business as usual, just a transition.
physician. When the system starts to go bad, they doctor the stuff. He writes this incredibly bad article in the Journal of the American a Medical Association extolling a, um, Obamacare. I don't know if you've read this thing. And it's a you know, political piece. He didn't write a word of it as far as I can tell. He got some assistants write it. And he kind of uses to grandstand the success of a program and never once in that article talks about the adverse collection collapse problem which is taking place at the time that the thing was written. Well, th these are... Uh, well, I'm just getting started. Yeah, right? yeah. No, no. I want to I give you a, a second to really uh, you know, find the eighth gear. Uh, on the way up, but um, you know, those are kind of personal observations, or they're psychological observations about uh, about Obama. Where, you know, how how does he get so far if he has a thin knowledge base? If he his programs are, are bad and are constantly failing. I mean, if you've ever met the guy, remember, he worked at the University yep. of Chicago. I was his interim dean for part of the time. His first impression is tremendously positive. He really knows how to carry himself, everything from his accent, his voice, his smile, and so forth. It's the kind of thing that brings people in. And in politics, if you can make a very good first impression, you're going to do pretty well. He's also pretty astute in, in managing to avoid getting involved in things. So if you wanted to take, for example, the bungled situation with respect to the potential indictment of Hillary Clinton for various frauds of one kind or another. The most striking thing about the president is he's nowhere to be seen in this particular discussion. All it could do is to bring him down. Uh, so if you're looking for four guys, it's Jim Comey at the FBI and it's Loretta Lynch sitting in the Department of Justice and God knows who else, or Whiteside, whoever, I don't even mm -hmm. know who it is, um, doing all of these things and he tends to be able to stay out of the particular fray. Yeah, it's uh, kind so of interesting that he's a you know, nobody, nobody is asking, well, where was he? If she, He must have known she was running a personal server, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, all of this stuff, I mean, he, he just manages to keep out of this. He has a, a press which is probably 80% liberal. I mean, put aside Fox News and the Wall Street Journal. They don't ask him particularly hard questions. Um, and, and what he does is he always manages to go public with a speech about empathy, explaining how he's going to start to help people. Um, he also essentially, he starts moving in other areas uh, with populist fervor. Um, he's terrifically good at taking after the banks. I mean, the prosecution and the settlement with respect to uh, the J.P. Morgan Chase on the so-called Madoff scandal was a true outrage. I mean, Eric Holder, in my judgment, is one of the worst attorney generals who ever served in that office. Why is that? Because he was abusive with respect to the people whom he hated and was mm -hmm. unduly charitable to the people whom he so liked. So explain how that played out with with the uh, well, J.P. Morgan Well, with, with the, what happened is Madoff essentially used J.P. Morgan to distribute payments to various people. And there had been an elaborate report by the Securities and Exchange Commission trying to figure out why it is that this fraud to save detection of everybody inside the business. And all people on the outside knew that the management of the SEC and its anti-fraud campaign was terrible because Madoff is turning out a relatively stable rate of returns in a higher volatile market. This doesn't happen in the universe. And countless numbers of people, many of whom actually spoke to me about this, said to the SEC, this does not look right to us, and they missed it all, right? So now they have this guy, he was not mentioned once, that is J.P. Morgan Chase, in the entire report. They're giving out payments to annual people, and all of a sudden they are the real culprits, because if they had warned us, we would have done it, so let's find them 10, 12, 14 billion dollars or whatever it is for these things. This is just outrageous. Then the abuse of the Justice Department with respect the various kinds of private enterprises, universities, um, with the big club. Uh, either you give your civil rights protections in the form that we wanted, or we're going to pull all the money from your medical research kinds of programs. Everybody starts to capitulate under these kinds of threats. And so there is in this administration the use of what they call the guidance. And what the guidance says is this is not really enforceable, but don't you cross us anyhow, even though it's not enforceable. And so we will then throw the book at you. So people capitulate. They don't have to give notice and comment hearing. They don't have to do enforcement procedures. And so for example, on the question of, of what kind of hearing do you start to give to people charged with sexual harassment cases or racial discrimination cases, they say the standard for a very serious charge is simply a preponderance of the evidence. No private university independently would mm -hmm. want to use that lowest standard. But sure enough, once you get the Obama threat, everybody starts to capitulate. Where is, uh, where is Congress during all of this? Because, uh, you know, and, and other uh, forces that should be pushing back. Obama has faced, I mean, he helped create a Republican Congress that he had to deal with through his first two years in office. Um, are they to blame? 
or, or how, do, how does their lack of action or potency factor into an assessment of the Obama well, years? Well, what you have to do is understand that Congress can do by way of investigation, and they do investigate, but it's easy to stonewall investigations and all the rest of that. But if they try to pass legislation, it's subject to a presidential veto. And then once the presidential veto comes into place, the sphere of executive action becomes very much larger. Um, the only time that it really matters that you get Congress is on some of these big budget issues, like the showdown over the deficit and so forth, but otherwise his Which the Repu last scene, the Republicans yeah. were trying to break the sequester yeah. cap yeah. just so they could spend more money. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I'm not... Yeah. Uh, no, I know you're not defending it. I'm, I'm, not, I'm, just, I'm just saying it's the it, whole yeah. thing, but on the military side, it's pretty unilateral with respect to the president. Mm -hmm. Many libertarians are much more dovish than I am, right. but I think virtually everybody agrees that he's incompetent as a commander-in-chief. And you, you think so because he hasn't been interventionist enough. But I, I don't think he has a coherent yeah. policy. Mm -hmm. um, I think is the is the first thing, and he doesn't know how to reassure his allies. Suppose you want to be non-interventionist. You don't become non-interventionist by essentially announcing red lines in Syria and then withdrawing. You don't start making deals with the Russian, which gives them sway. You don't start to announce publicly, well, they're going to get themselves into this quagmire from which they will never emerge. And yeah. then basically Putin treats this kid as though he's a child. I mean, it just and, yeah, and you don't reference. bomb Libya you yeah, know, and in the name of non-intervention. Uh, who is the last president for you? You know, I think you're right that Obama does not have a, mm -hmm. or did not articulate a clear, coherent foreign policy that could even be debated. George Bush kind of had one, which was equally disastrous. I, I well, I, let me give you my Bush yeah. view. There were three or four foreign policies by Bush, and I have different attitudes towards all of them. On the question of whether or not to go in or not, um, to, given the knowledge at the time, I was actually... To Afghanistan. Yeah, no, I'm talking oh, not to, Afghanistan. Okay. Everybody wanted to go yeah, yeah, into yeah. Afghanistan. Well, but then the question the Iraq. is when, how long do you want to yes, stay in Iraq? In Iraq. Yeah. But in Iraq, it was very tense. I could recall at the Hoover Institution attending briefings by people who were generally frightened out of their wits by the weapons of mass destruction. My own guess in retrospect is as follows. The reports that we intercepted, we read correctly, but they were all lies designed to deceive Saddam Hussein, who would otherwise mm -hmm. kill them if this program had not been advanced. And so we thought they were more advanced than they were. Uh, the war, the liberals basically thought the thing would be a disaster. It was a pretty effective war. Uh, the occupation immediately after that was a complete and total disaster. Bush had no idea mm -hmm. what to do. He put people in office who had no idea to do. They didn't know how to basically deregulate the economy. They basically dearmed the Bathists and they created all sorts of enemies of one kind or another. And the place was a complete disaster. And then he got himself together. And if you saw what Petraeus did, the guy was a miracle man. Um, he managed, he knew how to run it. And he was not just a military guy. He understood that whenever you want to do these things, it's a hearts and minds operation. It's a, a cooperation opposition. You've got to pay bribes to the devil in order to keep them going. He wrote about this in Foreign Affairs in 20 and 13, and it's clear he was remarkable. So 2009 comes, you have an uneasy stability, and then Obama makes it very clear he's a short term. This is a terrible mistake. Whatever your views were about the first three stages, getting in, fighting the war, the first failure, then the surge, you have to play the hand that you're dealt. And the moment we made it clear that we were going to get out, it was very clear that chaos would break out there. It became very clear to everybody else that the United States would not intervene anywhere. And so it's a free-for-all. So yeah, you and we're still there, and we're well, in well, Syria, they, and we're in Libya, yeah, and we're, we're in Yemen. In, we're in, yes, I, and, I mean, and, this is, I, I, and without we're, getting sidetracked. We're always in places where we're in trouble, because yep. essentially in the, what Powell said, Colin Powell said, was correct. Either you stay out or you get in right. Yeah, I, I agree. And, and I think the, does, the weight of evidence is now on the, uh, yeah, let's stay out. Because well, we're not very good at staying in. Well, so. I, let me put it this way. Yeah. With Obama as commander-in-chief, the correct rule is stay out. Yeah. Because he's incompetent to try to run one of these mm -hmm. things because he doesn't believe in it. If you had somebody who Why actually, do you say that? I mean, as opposed to he's incompetent and he doesn't, like, what is the evidence that he doesn't believe in it? What, he doesn't believe that... The United States can forcibly reform no, 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 various no, countries. No, no, no. And he probably he's probably right about no, that. No, I don't think that's what I mean. No. I mean, I mean, this is obviously a point of contention yeah, yeah. between us. I think what happens is he does not believe 
uh, that the United States is better than any other nation in anything that it ever does. He's very much an opponent of American exceptionalism, and he constantly kind of thinks of us as a colonialist power mm -hmm. of one sort or another. So, um, look, there are many disastrous right. interventions by the United States and many pretty good ones, uh, but I think in his particular case, the presumption is that we're always worse than we are. And what happens is this gets communicated to the rest of the world, that the president doesn't believe in his own country. He's always trying to figure out why we're wrong. So, right. you know, idle musings from a president can be absolutely deadly. So this guy gets in and you see some of these atrocities against the Yazidis and mm -hmm. so forth. Thousands of people giving you know, concern. What does the president do? He says, well, remember the Crusades. What does he know about the Crusades? I dare say absolutely nothing one way or another. Why they're relevant, he never starts to explain. I, yeah, I, I mean, I don't disagree with kind of your, mm -hmm. a lot of your thinking, mm -hmm. the conclusions, I guess. I, you know, for me, I don't understand how Obama thinks the way that you say he does, and, but then he's willing to bomb Libya. He's willing to use drone strikes all over the place, and he very clearly believes in his exceptionalism. And well, it seems the people person. around him are able to plan and distribute knowledge and peace well, and that was rainbow the, kisses everywhere. That was everywhere. the first point about the domestic yeah. economy. I mean, he certainly does believe that. I mean, I wish he was as non-interventionist as many of his critics Well, I wish he was, in many cases, I, I, what you have to do is you have to pick mm -hmm. your spot. Yeah. Uh, that's the first thing. The second thing is, the question is, how credible are your threats? That is. Yep. Uh, when people start looking at the United States, seeing the reduction in military power, the unwillingness to use it, while the cat's away, the mice will play. And, and so you now start seeing other kinds of alliances form in which the instabilities are really great. You see the situation in Yemen and another proxy war taking place. You see the takeover in Crimea. You see the Chinese building islands in the middle of the South China Sea and starting to move there. You see the... Ah, you're, this is, we're back at the Republican convention. Well, I, well let me put it <laughs> this way. Um, this yep. is a serious issue. I mean, if yep. they can claim, claim, you know, put up an island which is a pinprick in the ocean yeah, yeah, and have sure. a 200 mile zone everywhere around it in which they have exclusive control. Uh, by the same token, the idea bad. that, I mean, this in many ways you're channeling, I, I think, a, a, a kind of uh, American Cold War policy circa 1960 where it's wherever anybody else is, we need to be there. Um, and, you know, some of these are regional issues that really the, yes. the American government can't do much about and shouldn't do much well, about. Well, look, if, if you remember 1960, uh, the great talking point for our good friend John right. Kennedy was Quimoy and Matsu, right? Two little islands which are still right. under the control of the nationalists. But the idea that you yeah. go to war over Quimoy and Matsu was crazy. Yeah. Vietnam, much more complicated right. kind and, of interest. Uh, didn't quite and, work out so uh, well. It didn't work out well. Right. And of course, there, was, there are reasons, again, I mean, it's strange, it's the same problem. Johnson goes in, he's willing to put in 535,000 troops at the top, but he's not willing to bomb the North and he's not willing to bomb churches. So what happens? They use all the churches to store all their material. Uh, then you have Kennedy's, the Ivy yeah. League guy. What does he do? He takes DM and throws him out of office in November of 1963 before he's assassinated. They never get decent leadership afterwards. I mean, it's extremely difficult to play the intervention game. Eisenhower, of course, um, would be, was much more reluctant to get right. in, but he always kept the NATO line firm, but he wasn't mm -hmm. prepared to go into Hungary in 56. Right. He forced the Israelis out of the Sinai yep. principle yep. in 1956, both just before the election, right, taking yep. place. Um, he basically did not get involved big time in Lebanon. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think he yep. was pretty soon about it, but on the other hand, he did understand that one of the things you're trying to do is to make sure that the Soviet threat coming into right. Western Europe is going to be met, and all of a sudden, you know, Austria gets divided in a sensible way. You manage to keep the German situation relatively stable. Japan becomes relatively free. Greece is no longer threatened by the being in the thing. He actually did a lot right. of stuff that was very good. And of course, this is a, a very different world, too, where there were essentially two yeah. superpowers as opposed to a radically different um, yeah, kind of dis yeah, distribution of, of power That's around the world. Correct. Let's bring it into the 2016 election, and we, let's start with foreign policy. We have uh, you know three major candidates uh, who are polling level, say, above 8%, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, and Gary Johnson. Um, in terms of foreign policy, do you see any of them uh, capable of articulating a, a, you know, not necessarily a foreign policy that you agree with, but a coherent strategy in the first place, and then do you agree with it or not? Well, let me start this with Donald Trump. 
Incoherence is his middle name, and he has never thought hard about any problem in the world except how it is he could advance Donald Trump uh, through means private or public. So um, I don't. So you're on the Trump train. It sounds like. Uh, oh my God! I mean, but I mean, he just you know, for example, yeah. even on domestic policies now in favor of paid family leave, right. um, he's a pure politician on this stuff and has no experience in international affairs. And what is so terribly deadly about him is he also suffers from another Obama advice. He doesn't know how to take advice from anybody, and he will not bring around him any good people, and no good people will want to serve him. So I regard him as a disaster. Hillary Clinton, I mean, when she was Secretary of State, my friends at Hoover, who were you know, the ex-generals and so forth, thought that she was actually much more competent than Obama in terms of the way in which she was realistic and kind of the assessment of these things. But you know, after she goes out on the husting, she now meets Bernie Sanders, and she starts making kind of public imperatives, and they, they, it's always dangerous. Look, maybe you don't want to go into Iraq again, mm -hmm. but you don't want to say never again because right. you don't know what's going to happen. Can I ask, with foreign policy, what were Hillary Clinton's big successes? That no. the, the generals, but they're like, oh, but she's better no, than but Obama. No, but they basically didn't think that she had much power. And so their attitude okay. was, uh, the way in yeah. which it came back to me, and this is all fourth, well, yeah. actually second hand, yeah. um, was that in the deliberations they thought she made more sense than the president, but mm -hmm. he was such a strong-willed fellow that right. he always did what exactly what he wanted. Mm -hmm. The Benghazi thing was the classic evasion that you often yeah. see with respect to people. And you know, Harold Coe is a distinguished anti-war guy when he's a dean at the Yale Law School, and then writes these ridiculous memos to the effect that if we're shooting at them and they're not shooting at us, uh, then it turns out that we're not engaged in military activities that would will trigger some kind of mm -hmm. requirements under the declarations of wars acts and so forth. Um, so I mean, I think at this particular point she is going to be adrift. Mm -hmm. My view about it is, you know, you have to have a big stick, but you yeah. can't wield it in every particular case. Let me ask. And I think there's too much unilateral surrender before the fight begins. Talking more broadly, you had mentioned that Trump is mm -hmm. incoherent. He is walled off from yeah. expert advice other than that which reflects yeah. what he already believes. Uh, Hillary Clinton, you're worrying about her. Uh, talk a little bit about the Bernie Sanders effect on her, not just in terms of foreign policy, but in general policy. And are you worried, I mean, if you, you trash talked Obama pretty well, do you have similar concerns about her? Maybe not that she doesn't know a lot. I mean, she's had a lot of experience in office and, you know, and in and around the White House, but is she a, is she a bad person to be president? Well, let me put it this way. She certainly is extremely thorough, extremely conscientious. She briefs pretty well and so forth. Um, but the difficulty is, A, does she have a core? And I think the answer to that question is no. I mean, she's buffeted about. And also- So she isn't, I mean, in the- I mean, she's not like Sanders, who's a yeah. true believer. Right, right. I mean, the issue that you ask about her is, will she stay bought by anybody? Because, mm -hmm. I mean, she is, in fact, somebody who kind of goes with the flow. She was the second most left senator when Obama was the first most left senator in the United States Senate. This is back, you know, before 2008. Um, and I think she is basically left. Her domestic policies on things like labor are terrible and the anti-discrimination law is terrible and all the rest of that stuff. I think the difference between her and Obama is that she is temperamentally a little bit more cautious, afraid about her flanks being attacked. And so that whereas he's prepared to go from here to there, move very rapidly, she's going to go more incrementally with respect to what has happened. I also think that unlike other people, she does listen more to her advisors. I mean, it is noted even around this building, the number of people who are really rather able whom she's recruited to work in her particular campaign, and they tend to be of this sort of technocratic professoriate type. And uh, can we uh, announce the news here? You're going to be her attorney general? Well, that, uh, that's the hope in the uh, plan, yes. yes. Uh, uh, actually, I, I'm running for all three guys, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, not going to happen, but I mean, she does have people who are actually smart. Look, even Obama had some that was smart, but it turns out nobody matters but Valerie Jarrett, and she's yeah. just not up to that kind of a job. What about Gary Johnson? He is doing historically high for a Libertarian Party candidate. Uh, it's unlikely, and you know, let's define unlikely as impossible that he would win. 
Is he doing a good job injecting libertarian discourse into mainstream politics? Doesn't seem to be. I mm -hmm. mean, look, I don't follow him particularly closely, and in fact, I don't think anybody follows him particularly closely. He has tended to get tied up in things like the drug issues and so forth, which I think are tangential to the great issues of America. You know, if he can't pronounce Aleppo, know where it is or what's going on, um, it's the kind of gaffe that it's impossible to paper over no matter how much you apologize. I thought his post-Aleppo statement was actually pretty pretty good. Uh, but in politics, the five-second gaffe gets 90% of the attention, and the two-minute thoughtful apology gets 5% you know, or 10% of the attention. Well, at that particular rate, you're going backwards. He won't get into the debates, and we know why that happens. And that's not going to give him a chance to project himself. Um, he actually has to share the sidelights with Jill Stein on the, on the left-wing party. So I don't think that he's going to turn out to be much of a force in this case. I think he will get votes, but my guess is that most of these votes are protest votes. I mean, I understand perfectly well people who say, I cannot vote for a woman who I think belongs in jail, and I cannot vote for a man who I think is generally emotionally and mentally unstable. Um, what, what, did, uh, what has Hillary done that puts her in jail? Well, I mean, oh, if you actually go through this stuff, I mean, uh, first of all, the server situation, the creation and the use of a server, whether or not the leaks have taken place, is in fact pretty clearly a criminal offense judged by a recklessness standard. Uh, there's probably a very strong set of obstruction of justice charges that could be made when you start wiping these servers clean after you're on notice of the fact that an investigation is going to take place. In the second Bush years, there was an expansion of the um, obstruction of justice statutes um, to cover exactly cases like this. And Comey did not even talk about them when he gave his right wash, saying, I think she was you know, seriously negligent, but not culpably right. negligent, which is double talk of the worst right. sort. Well, and also that yeah. if anybody else did it, he wants to reserve yes. the right to the put them in the slam. And then, yeah. of course, I mean, the shenanigans that took place when they dropped the whole investigation. He refuses to prosecute, and Loretta Lynch says, I'm bound to accept his advice. She was just wrong. The correct thing to do is, if she compromises herself, is not to cede the authority to the FBI who doesn't have it. It's to find somebody in her department who can actually review these things. I think this whole case has gone forward without anybody doing a serious memo on any point of relevance with respect to the mental states of the actus reus, the particular conduct that goes place. There is also, I think, the real question of undue influence and cooperation with the Clinton Foundation, mm -hmm. which was never stubborn to this. And there is the very annoying fact that the way in which this investigation was conducted by the FBI, they did not follow standard procedures. They interviewed her at the end of the process rather than at the beginning of the process. Um, I don't know all the records, but that's part of the problem in this particular case. Let me ask but you. But the math is yeah. completely off. Here, you know, uh, one of the things that I've, I've heard you talk mm -hmm. about is, you know, what, what happens when every aspect of life becomes politicized? Um, you know, and obviously political investiga or investigations of political players are always politicized, but um, are we at a point where the United States is essentially moving from a kind of high trust society or a high trust community where we kind of agree that our, our leaders, they're not perfect, they're not saints, but they're trying to do the right thing and they pretty much follow the laws that they uh, write for the rest of us, to one in which uh, you, in which looks more and more like Southern Europe or, or developing parts of the world where it's like, no, you understand people go into politics because they're bad people and they act poorly. Rules get adjudicated, you know, depending on who the subject is so that if it's a wealthy, connected person, they skate. If it's somebody else, they get screwed. Um, do you feel like we're going in that direction? And then what are some of the, uh, if so, what are some of the outcomes? Well, the obvious situation, just look at the difference in the treatment of Scooter Libby, who gets charged after they set him up for trivial things, and Hillary Clinton, who manages to dodge the situation, even though I think the charges are really very serious, and they were delayed in the enforcement and all the rest. But that's at the top level. Uh, but I do think that's what's happened is two things really matter. One is there's an increased polarization inside this country. The middle is essentially hollowed out. Uh, Twenty years ago, Bill Clinton was at the center, and he was basically a right-wing Democrat, pretty pro-market, respectful of the bond market, more interventionist mm -hmm. than you would be, mm -hmm. uh, but kind of committed to keeping the welfare framework in place. Now you look what's happened. All of his compromise positions are spurned. Uh, so the, you know, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, the ACLU put it in place, 
very sensibly mm -hmm. in 1993. They repudiate it today. DOMA, which is the stuff on same-sex marriages, is now unconstitutional, whereas it was a very high consensus operation. Welfare reform, which seemed to work pretty well in the 1990s, mm -hmm. is now basically regarded as uh, terrible. Free, free trade is free trade has gone completely yeah. on the opposite direction. Uh, and, and so, but what about the Republicans or conservatives who are, are constantly saying now because Planned Parenthood gets some money from the government, not specifically to do abortions, like we have to shut the government down? Well, I, look, my I mean, are, is, I mean, the polarization is in both directions. I, I think it's more on the Democratic yeah. side than the Republican side, but you're right. And I mean, the greatest mistake that Newt Gingrich made was shutting down the government when he had the disagreement with Ken, with the president in the nineteen mid-1990s, 1995, I guess it was. And this is just absolute insanity. I don't think this is true about uh, Paul Ryan, but the, the best way to explain your position, which is quite credible, is you get the, the guys like Boehner, and he resigns because he can't deal with his Tea Party opposition. I mean, they basically say we are pure and ineffective, that is, we don't get anything changed, but we stand for our principles. He said we've got to make compromises, and he was done. So I think there's some of that on the Republican side. Uh, but I think, in effect, the, the biggest difference is the Republicans who are being resisted to trying to basically keep to the status quo while the whole system is getting larger, the Democrats are moving very aggressively to get things further to the left. The most conspicuous area of this, a banking regulation and labor market regulation and so forth, I think it's really been quite dramatic. Uh, civil rights enforcement has really been ratcheted up. And I think they're the ones who have tended to make the main policy initiatives. But look, the president in the modern economy, being a single office with a single man, is more powerful than a divided and a confused Congress. And what we're seeing, I think it's fair to say, unfortunately, is this playing forward with a guy who is, in my judgment, a very weak president because he doesn't know the limits sensible limits that should be imposed upon himself. But if you look at our Constitution, I'll just end on this note, uh, there are lots of gaps in what it does. And what you need to do is to have comedy, a sense of self-restraint, uh, so that people continue to operate in what you say is this high-cost environment. But now the tendency is everybody pushes their legal rights to the limit. These soft buffers tend to be understated, and you're going to get much more ugly confrontations. The net effect is going to be a slow decline in American growth, happiness, prosperity, and wisdom. And so you know, the trajectory is down. Uh, the first order of business is to reduce the rate of decline. The second order of the business is to try to get it into reverse. Well, I'm a little skeptical. I, I just, uh, I, the, yeah, I'd say a little. The lights are going out all over America. Very quick, uh, Les, what is a worse scenario, a Hillary presidency or a Trump presidency? Well, it's you? high variability on both sides, I think, and, and it depends on which Trump shows up. Uh, Hillary, I think you know what she's going to do. She's going to push hard to the left within conventional reasons and not do anything crazy. Uh, with Trump, if he kind of, as it were, keeps to the script, he could possibly be better on the high side on deregulation mm -hmm. and domestic issues and maybe a better foreign negotiator in part because he is a little bit crazy. But if he goes insane, uh, then yeah. in effect God knows what's going to happen. And so the argument in favor of Hillary is it's a low median and a low variance, and the argument in favor of Trump is it's a low median and a high variance. If you think he's going to be high, you do one thing, low another so thing. So who, who are you going to vote for? Uh, I'm going to sit out this. I mean, I can't bring myself to vote for either of these particular candidates. And uh, to me, I'll just end on this note. <laughs> I am an academic. I know it sounds odd. Uh, buying a candidate is like buying a market basket of goods, half of which you want to throw out. I think it's more. That's the basket of deplorables. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so whatever. And so by not voting for either of them, I'm free to criticize each of them or to praise them as it may be on an issue by issue basis. I'm an issue guy. I'm not a candidate guy in this world. Uh, nobody's going to ever get me for public office. I hope I have some influence on opinion. Mm -hmm. I hope that even our sparring on this issue is of interest to the audience that, invite, that we're hoping to attract. And so thank you. For well, having thank me. you very much. We will leave it there. We have been talking with Richard Epstein. He is an NYU professor of law. He's also at University of Chicago Law and the Hoover Institution. Richard, thanks so much for your time. Oh, it was great. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.